Every day, something dramatic happens in the Caribbean that affects our lives. We'll give you the details. We'll give you the facts on Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Fedrick. How's Eddie Fedrick? So glad you can join us. Guyana Police Force says Nandlal is not wanted in the United States. This story takes center stage in today's edition of Caribbean Perspective for Friday 20th August 2021. Details when we return. Did you know that your friends and family can now shop at the Food Fair from anywhere in the world and you can receive here in Grenada? The Food Fair and GrenadaMarket.com now make it possible through secure online shopping and personalized customer service. Simply send your loved ones a list of your preferred items or let them fill an online basket and the items will be available for pickup or delivery. Visit GrenadaMarket.com or thefoodfair.gd today for more details. The new norm. Spread the news. Welcome back. Is Guyana's Attorney General wanted in the United States for allegedly threatening to kill the President of the Caribbean Guyana Institute for Democracy, Rickford Burke? The Guyana police says it's not true, while Mr. Burke told Travis Chase that the matter is not closed and that a report is lodged with the NYPD. Here is HGP's Travis Chase with more. The Guyana Police Force says it is not true that Guyana's Attorney General Alil Nandlal is wanted or had been under investigation for aggravated harassment in the United States. Director of Communications of the Guyana Police Force, Mark Ramotar, told reporters on Tuesday that at the request of Mr. Nandlal, the Guyana Police Force inquired from the New York Police Department whether Mr. Nandlal is wanted by any law enforcement agency in the United States of America. Mr. Ramatar said that the NYPD has communicated to the Ghana Police Force that Mr. Nandlal was never wanted by any law enforcement body in the United States of America. In fact, according to Mr. Ramatar, the NYPD, quote, dismissed the report as frivolous and vexatious, unquote. The alleged aggravated harassment occurred between July 5 and 6, 2021 at Far Rockaway, Queens, New York, in which Mr. Nandalal has been accused of plotting to kill President of the Caribbean Guyana Institute for Democracy, Rickford Burke. Burke told Nightly News on Tuesday that Mr. Nandalal and the Guyana Police Force are telling lies. That's an absolute lie that the police said that. Even if this matter is closed and I'm not aware that it is, no police department can make that determination. Criminal complaints to the police are investigated by the police, and the findings of that investigation go to the district attorney, and in a case where charges are required, those charges are adjudicated by a judge and a court. No police department can determine whether or not a case is frivolous and vexatious. This document shows that the NYPD is indeed in receipt of a complaint from Rickford Burke. According to the complaint, police say that Mr. Burke reported that Mr. Nandlal stated he must be killed. They're abusing the Guyana police force. This is ample evidence that they're abusing the Guyana police force as their own vendetta squad to pursue persons with whom they disagreed politically or who, the, who they see as political enemies. I will discuss this matter with the NYPD. I've asked for a meeting with the chief of Brooklyn, and I will further discuss the police involvement in this case with the Justice Department and the State Department because the Guyana government thinks that it's so powerful that it can interfere and meddle in the criminal justice system and the political system of the United States of America. Mr. Burke was among a group of protesters outside of a restaurant in Queens, New York, where the Attorney General had been meeting with supporters of the PPP in July. Travis Chase, HGP Nightly News. Meantime, Guyana's Vice President Barrett Jagdeo has poured cold water on a notion that the country will start to see real wealth from the proceeds of oil real soon. More in this news source Guyana report with Gordon Mosley. Responding to questions from the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies in the U.S., Mr. Jagdew said although the country has been receiving oil revenues, he does not classify the country as a wealthy one, noting that it will take years before Guyanese start seeing real wealth and benefits from the oil resources. Oil, oil revenue autumn, 
the magnitude that would see major flows to Ghana. It's not coming for the next few years. We still have to three, four hundred million dollars a year now. It's not a lot of money, and many people think, oh, the wealth will come tomorrow, or it's here today, and suddenly we have to start splurging. We have to live within our means for quite a while in the, in the, in, into the future. Mr. Jagu said while the government is focusing on the oil economy, it will also invest heavily in the non-oil sector so that the country will not only depend on proceeds from oil. In the meantime, though, he said the oil revenues will be used to raise the standard of living of Guyanese. On the question of direct cash transfers to Guyanese, the vice president does not see it as feasible currently. So a lot of people believe we have a lot of money to give, like before the elections, one gentleman said that oh, we must give every Guyanese family um, $5,000 per annum. So when you multiply 200,000 households, that's a billion dollars per annum. And we're only collecting maybe 300 million. So, and people actually believed it. So sometimes, you know, for political purposes, people raise expectations. So that's why it's, it's, we have to constantly be out there talking to people. In 2018, as opposition leader, Mr. Jagdew said he would back conditional cash transfers to citizens. One year later, in 2019, he said his party would support targeted cash transfers. By 2020, Mr. Jagdew said the issue would have to be closely examined. During the forum in Texas yesterday, the vice president said he envisions that the oil revenue will be used to fund projects to develop the people as well as world-class health and education. He is currently leading a government and private sector delegation at a major oil and gas conference in Houston, Texas. <laughs> You're listening to Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Frederick. With the detection of the Delta variant of the coronavirus in St. Lucia, Health Minister Moses Jean-Baptiste is not writing off the possibility of a temporary travel ban, although there is no indication that the government is considering the option. However, the minister has indicated that the administration will be revisiting the COVID-19 protocols. Don Nicholas of DBS News World has more. Friday, August 13th, St. Lucia recorded the first three cases of the Delta variant, two of whom were U.S. nationals and the other a St. Lucia national. Health Minister Moses Jabatiste says the arrival of the new variant, which is wreaking havoc in neighboring Martinique and other parts of the world, changes everything and highlights the need for government to revisit the existing COVID-19 protocols. Mr. Jabatiste did not say how soon the protocols would be revisited, but he did say that discussions with the hotels and medical professionals on the way forward are ongoing. The Minister with Responsibility for Tourism has had several consultations with the, the hotels and with um, areas of um, entertainment, people who do that kind of thing. And yes, you are correct. We are very concerned and we are currently having discussions with the medical professionals from our office, from our, our department, our ministry, and also with the Minister with Responsibility for Tourism to see what can be done. It is very clear to us that we may have to revisit the protocols because the Delta variant um, changes everything. With Martinique averaging nearly 600 new COVID-19 cases a day and tourists being asked to leave, serious questions as to whether St. Lucia should impose a temporary travel ban have been raised. The minister did not say whether local authorities would be heading in that direction, but he has not written off the possibility. There are professionals who say to me, yes, there is trouble in Martinique, but we are having tourists coming from other epicenters, New York, Miami. And therefore, whatever we do, we have to follow the science. And if we have to decide on, um, on protocols for incoming visitors or incoming passengers, we have to do it across the board. And we want to ensure that whatever we do is based on the science. So the, the issue of a travel ban, 
um, if we have to do it, if we have, if it gets to that, uh, obviously when we, our focus is the protection of the people of St. Lucia. And if it comes to that and the medical profit, the science says that is where we have to go, then clearly the government will look at all options that the, the medical professionals and the science point us to. Currently a 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew remains in effect. For the DBS News World, I'm Don Nicholas. In the meantime, DBS's Don Nicholas again reports that Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Gibbon Ferdinand, is encouraging citizens with children 12 years and over to get them vaccinated. The appeal came as St. Lucia received the first tranche of the Pfizer vaccine from the U.S. government on Tuesday afternoon. On Tuesday, St. Lucia received the first tranche of 52,560 doses of the Pfizer vaccine from the United States. Based on evidence from clinical trials, scientists say the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is 95% effective against laboratory-confirmed infections. The vaccine can be administered to children 12 years and over. This has prompted Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Gibeon Ferdinand, who is also a former principal of the Miku Secondary School, to call on parents to have their children inoculated. The very same thing we say to adults. Um, we have a large population of young people, especially children, and if there is any vaccine that is um, appropriate or can be used by them, I think parents would need to take that responsibility to encourage their children to be vaccinated. Mr. Ferdinand acknowledges that it is a choice, but the parents can influence their children into taking the vaccine. I know it's a choice, just like it is with adults. But with children, I think it is a little easier to have the, the parents to, to um, uh, encourage them to take it. Ferdinand is hoping that the school population makes use of the new vaccine. For the DBS News World, I'm Don Nicholas. One woman is telling her story about the treatment meted out to her as a COVID-19 patient at the Scarborough General Hospital. She spoke with TV6's reporter Elizabeth Williams while she was in the intensive care unit of the hospital. And here is that report. The woman told TV6 that while warded in the intensive care unit, ICU, she was treated with utmost care as a COVID patient. She said she saw death twice and thought she would not make it. The pregnant mother told us, since being released from the unit and put on the maternity ward, the attitude of some health professionals changed. The woman said, quote, nurses afraid to deal with COVID patients. Imagine I come from ICU negative and in a room on the maternity ward. The younger nurses not coming to ask you, okay, you need anything? Imagine I asked for a pan about 6 a.m. to clean up. The pan, same place. I haven't got breakfast as yet. I am here hungry and I'm pregnant. Lunch coming in in the room late. Dinner coming in late. I have to wait for older nurses or call on the hospital phone if I need something. This is madness, she said. In one instance, breakfast was served to her at 10 a.m. She said, quote, at 10 a.m. I eat breakfast. The nurse saying breakfast come late with attitude, but as I complain, breakfast reach. They said they're not supposed to be in the room any length of time. All these nonsense they're telling me. They said they are short staff. If I need something, I have to call on 660-4744 extension 3134 or 3123. Madness. So if I don't have money on my phone, what happens? She said the story is some of the nurses, especially the young ones, don't want to treat with the COVID patients as they are afraid to do so. She said, quote, since I in the room is only one time it mopped, I guess they are short staff, so they say. I sat on a bloody sheet for three days. When I asked why the sheet was not changed, I was told how often did I change my sheet at home? She said, only when she complained, there is some change. When asked to comment on the matter, Chief Executive Officer of the Tobago Regional Health Authority, Wesley Orr, said the matter would be looked into. Elizabeth Williams, TV6 News. Hubbard's big promotion is back. Live free for one year. Spend $50 or more in any Hubbard's department and receive a chance to win. Big prizes every month. Property or vehicle insurance for one year. Free internet, cable and data for one year. Free fuel for one year. Free cooking gas for one year. 
free electricity for one year, free drinks for one year, extra cash account, and the big free groceries for one year. Promotion runs from April 1st to September 30th, 2021. Live free for one year with Hubbard's in association with Solgas, Flow, Grenadian General Insurance, Cara Brewery, Coca-Cola, Grenada Bottling Company, Grenlec, Communal Cooperative Credit Union, Dutch Lady Milk, Promo, Danny and Supreme. Terms and conditions apply. I am Eddie Frederick, wishing you a restful weekend. This has been Caribbean Perspective, a whole new approach to highlighting developments in the Caribbean. In the meantime, please continue to log on to CaribbeanPerspective.com for more daily news and more.